this is kind of the screensaver of some of the work that I do, some of the drawings and sketches. There might be some stuff you recognize if you guys go watch really bad movies that have big budgets. Um, I do a lot of that, kind of monsters running around, people screaming, Brad Pitt running. Um, <clears throat> so I'll tell you a little bit about myself. I mean, Brandy did a pretty good job. I started off um, studying fluid dynamics and robotics at Caltech. And I realized really quickly something about that school, you had to be really smart. Um, so I took the hint and I went to a different school. I went up to the design school, the art center up on the hill. Um, and really just got fascinated with the idea of transportation design and just design in general. And kind of, as I did more and more projects and had the opportunity to work at BMW while I was there, um, I kept thinking, oh, I'll find the one thing I want to do in life. And, the thing I loved about a design consultancy is that it's a constantly learning environment. It's always changing, it's always dynamic and different every day. And um, <clears throat> just absolutely loved it. So I went back to school just to finish off. Um, I got a really unusual uh, opportunity to go work at Rhythm and Hughes with John Hughes. And I really got, at that point, I got kind of hooked on the idea of designing story and experience. And it kind of took another dynamic from industrial design. I mean, my experience, not too many architects get get the opportunity to design a house that scares the shit out of kids. Um, and I really found that interesting as, as a challenge. Like, how can we really terrify them, like really just warp them for life? Um, it's a different design challenge. So in doing that, it was, it was quite fun. But I figured what I'd do is, um, I can look at some of the stuff later. Uh, so anyways, I just did that. And then I, when I graduated, I, I got a job offer to go work at Oakley. Um, we, design glasses, most of you guys know that. Um, so we did a whole bunch of stuff and tried to expand their brands into shoes and bags and watches and all sorts of stuff. And we had a little project called Red that was kind of under the cover that was quiet, so the Black Magic guys might know, um, which was the original Red camera. Uh, so we had a little bit of experience in that space. But I'll, I'll get on with the show. So I wanted to talk a little bit about this concept of design thinking, and I think to a large degree this is kind of an audience that um, I don't get to speak to too much because it's kind of preaching to the choir, I think, a little bit. Um, but uh, I do, now working with the university, I talk to a lot of people that don't really understand the concept of design thinking. But this idea of design thinking from a strategy point of view, and uh, the example that I use is um, you know, not a new one, but that kind of idea of Thomas Edison, most people kind of equate his greatest invention with the, the light bulb. In reality, the light bulb existed for 100 years prior. It just wasn't sustainable. Um, what Edison's real genius, and I think where he used leverage design thinking, was in understanding the overall system, to understanding how power could be transmitted, how could you generate power, what was the involvement, what was the experience, and really looked at it from a human-centric perspective. How do I relate with this? You know, the oil industry at that point was based on whale oil. It was a completely disruptive thing to really think of, where you, know, you have somebody like Nikola Tesla, which I kind of fall into the camp that was much more interesting and, and innovative, but didn't necessarily always get the whole picture in the system that how his technology could work in that space, and it caused a lot of problems for him. Um, and this goes to kind of the idea that I think a lot of us use, which is this idea of nonlinear thinking, this kind of idea of growing the trees from the leaves down, that being able to start with all those kind of multiple uh, influences and perspectives and how each one of us kind of brings something unique to the table to eventually over a period of time through obvious reasons, whether it's reality of physics to whatever it might be, cost, distribution, company's capability to kind of finite that down into the space that we're at. Um, I am doing a speed presentation, so they warned me. Um, again, it's something you guys fully know, but for me, the, when I talk to people that aren't immersed in design, this is a fundamental characteristic that I think they miss more often than not. And it is kind of design 101, but this idea that there's a difference between engineering and this conceptual nature and design, that once you bring the human element into the process, it's now a design problem. And if you don't look at it from how the human relates with that system or that part or that technology, you're going to core miss the difference. And I think too much strategy is done in the boardroom by CEOs, by marketing departments, and then design is brought in as a tactical execution. And you've really, I think to a lot of degree, you've shot yourself in the foot before you ever get going. And we've heard a lot of that today. So, um, And this just goes to kind of the definitions of this stuff. And again, this is kind of obvious, but... You know, when I hear our prime minister say, you know, innovation seems like an overused word, why don't we use invention? Maybe because it means something totally different, that might be a good reason. Um, but, you know, he's a politician and it is show business for ugly people. Um, 
But I think one thing that's important to, to talk about is, is not just the empathy for the problem and starting at this kind of, you know, we describe ourselves a lot of ways nonlinear people, but again, we usually go through a linear process to some degree, whether that's finding the empathy or the problem, associating what that is and going through the systematic approach that we take. But I think to some degree, you know, to keep in mind, to look at it at the end, what's the meaning we're actually building? It's, is it a better phone system network or is it a better widget or whatever the product is? Well, what are you actually doing? If, and, and where do we sit in the kind of food chain of innovation, um, which I'll talk about in a sec. So, yeah, and this, this goes to kind of disruptive innovation. You know, what, what really is disruptive? I hope you read that fast. I did that just to see if you were, because it was really important. Um, <laughs> But this kind of idea around being disruptive, and what does that actually mean? I don't think, you know, 10, 15 years ago, I don't think anyone was really nervous in the music industry about Apple coming up with MP3 players or a little iTunes store, yet they've pretty much annihilated and taken over the entire industry. So we see these innovations as being disruptive. Oh, we jumped. Oh, well. Um, but it's critical because are you in the sustainment area? Are you sustaining your innovation? Are you creating another product? So you say the Apple 5 comes out, well, who's buying the Apple 4? So you're not being disruptive. You're not being really innovative other than on a micro level. You're basically just sustaining your innovation. And the reason I say that is because no one buys the Apple 4 once the Apple 5 is available. You're replacing and renewing. So there's value to that, but you have to understand where on that ecosystem you are. And then later in life, when you go into the efficiency model, uh, which I'll talk a little bit about. I'm just going to jump the slide got switched. Um, and this just goes to the kind of fuzzy line of innovation that things are coming up. They don't always come from top-down technology. Um, and the example I use with this was, um, I don't know if you guys saw an SBS show. It was on a couple months ago here. Um, but it talked about Heston Blumenthal. If you guys are familiar with him, he's, he's rather a pretty good chef. Um, but the interesting part, he was brought on to, with the British Navy to say, look, we can't spend more than $3 a day on food for a sailor in a submarine. Um, they basically go underwater for six months and don't come up. And morale's an issue because the first two weeks they get halfway decent food and then they're pretty much looking at each other and thinking about barbecue sauce. Um, <clears throat> so how, how could somebody who's kind of an innovative chef maybe look at this problem in a different way? And the first thing he did was kind of look at what were the old, you know, Lord's Nelson ship, what were the meals that they did? And he made these really kind of, you know, fine dining, you know, bizarre stuff that nobody, if they knew what it was, would touch. Um, but then he, t he it was just kind of a chance sequence. He had to look at the storage facility and where they actually store food on a boat. Um, and, and he saw these guys bringing boxes of onions and boxes of tomatoes and stuff. And was, you know, knowing from a restaurant, you bring a crate of onions into a space. By the time you've reduced that and used the French cooking, by the time you've reduced that down to actually what gets served, it's this much food. But most of that gets reduced down into stocks and other things. He's like, well, why can't we do that process first? So all of a sudden, now we're bringing in nine, ten times as much food, pre-cooked, higher nutrition rate, much, much better. And so now he dramatically, if you look at what the innovation was or the disruption, he's basically given the British Navy a completely game-changing defensive throw. So they now can stay at sea for two to three times longer than they could before. If you think about what other technology could have given the British Navy that kind of leverage or that kind of innovation, there's almost nothing. It wouldn't be a new missile system. It wouldn't be a boat. It wouldn't be able to make air better out of the sea. Um, so this is, I think, some of the places we need to look even outside the design community for, for just insight and bringing those kind of people together in a collaborative way. Um, and this is kind of what I was talking about before, the difference and, and what the benefits are. You know, being disruptive, like the guys at Black Magic, you're being disruptive, what are you doing? You're creating jobs. Ford, give me your engineers, give me your designers. It's also capital intensive. So the VCs of the world and the banks are happy to use, put that capital into space and get it to work. Sustainable innovation, which a lot of companies are at, it's bigger, but you're not really hiring, you're not really growing, you're kind of using the resources you've already built. There's not a huge component that you really need to drive. So it's not going to accelerate the growth in a community in the same capacity. And then the efficiency, which is kind of this race to the bottom, getting stuff off the asset books, getting, getting these kind of things thinner and thinner and thinner. Um, the warning I put to this is there's also another term that goes with it, which is called bigger, bigger bankrupt. And this is usually when large companies are looking at a place where they are about to be disrupt. And if you're in the innovation, or efficiency, innovation, beware, especially nowadays. 
this is just something I, I talk a little bit about when I'm in Australia, you know, that, and this goes a little bit to the university's thinking as well, that the kind of idea of being able to produce research and really you're producing knowledge is, is extremely strong. The Australian, uh, I'd say, country punches well above its weight, but where, where it's really weak is in the second component, and it's getting much, much better, but being able to leverage that knowledge into innovation and bring it back into market. Um, from my experience now working in a university, uh, I find this all the time. You know, you have a casual conversation about something that a client might be battering around an idea, and they say, oh, yeah, we did that a half dozen years ago, and we wrote a paper about it. And I'm like, really? A cure for cancer, people might be interested in hearing about this. Did you ever think about maybe doing something? You know, it's just it's frustrating sometimes to go, you've already solved these problems, but they just don't have that culture. Um, so it's an interesting space. Um, <clears throat> and it also goes to what does the innovation economy look like? I think when you look at and this is generalizations for sure, but when you look at Russia, Canada, and Australia, because they have so much natural mineral resources and the economies are so based on those kind of chains being the big players in the space, that they haven't had the necessity, and I think that goes to the point that was made about New Zealand before, is that because they don't have the, the big holes in the ground, that they've had to think about things, they've had to be innovative. You can see the same kind of thing happen you know, in the 50s in Japan. They didn't have the natural resources, they had to be clever, they had to do something with those resources. So, but I think you know, we need to actually start fostering and, and really kind of push that innovation space as a priority. Um, so you guys have never heard this, I know. Um, so <laughs> coming back to the design space, so the most overused term in, in design, it, but it's true, form does follow function. But the thing I kind of add to it that I think is really critical is that a lot of times we forget that it's dictated by ceremony. So whether it's a camera and how a filmmaker or a DP experiences on set and how they actually capture things, what is their ceremonies? But the one I usually use as an example is sushi. Most, most, some people like sushi, I like sushi. Um, you can eat it, if you don't know how to use chopsticks, you can use a fork a lot more efficiently. But there's something just inherently wrong about doing that. It's just, it's kind of like, you know, everyone thought, oh, the e-readers are out, and there's a half dozen of them, that all of a sudden books are never going to be used. But there's a whole group of people that like the smell, the weight, the feel, the fact that the book's heavy on the right hand, and as I go through it, it becomes heavy on the left hand. All those subtle innuendos and subtle, sophisticated things that we're not necessarily consciously aware of really play at a core of where we find an interesting design. Um, and I think a lot of times, if we can identify not, not just the core problem or the job that needs to be addressed, but what's the actual ceremony of this? How would you want to experience this product that you might have some real insight into finding a completely different direction? Uh, I think too, too many times we get a manufacturer or a company that's got a brief because they know the business better than you do. And it goes to that you know, <laughs> client versus designer thing. Um, but I think sometimes to get them to understand that just because they do it some way doesn't mean it's the best or the right way to do it. Um, and this just goes to another thing with, you know, the kind of idea of analog versus digital. Um, we, I think, as a fundamental species or humans, we are at a core analog. We are not digital. The lack of our capabilities and technology are digital. So we make digital technology because we don't know how to do it analog yet. But it doesn't mean we don't want it that way. So I think it's another thing you can scrub your designs through. If you start looking at how can I make this more analog, and it could be what, you know, Steve Jobs and those guys took from Xerox with a trash can and being able to throw something away. There's plenty of examples of this existing, but I think it's a good thing to put through your process to know, if I can make this more analog, is it going to be more successful? Is it going to be more intuitive of use? Um, and, and the other example that I use for this is next time you're having coffee or dinner with a friend, uh, wait until they look at their watch. Right? And this is kind of how I prove this comment. As soon as they look at their time, ask them what time it is. Nine times out of 10, if it's an analog watch, they will look at their watch again because they are not looking to see what time it is. We're event-based creatures. We move based on from event to event to event. The rest is just fill. So what they're looking at, and it's part of the brain being lazy but also incredibly smart, it's looking at the negative space before they know they have a ne the next event or thing that they need to do or be concerned with. So they didn't look at what the time is. They're just looking at that negative space. Now, if you have somebody with a digital watch, they'll tell you exactly what time it is down to the second, but it takes the human mind up to five minutes to make that translation. So how can you be analog? You know, I love the, you know, the old dials. If you look at old race cars, they used to take the Stuart Warner gauges, which is the brand, so oil pressure and fuel and all these kind of things, and they used to just twist them 
so that when they were running right, all the needles went in the exact same space. So in the half tenth of a second that they could look down, all they needed to know is the needles were lined up. They didn't know what anything else was. And if one needle was off, then it ne needed their attention. So it shows the adaption of that. Well. <clears throat> So this is something, again, I talk a lot about. And this is some, for me, I found this really useful in identifying how my clients and how I'm relating to them. Um, I'm a very horizontal person. So what I mean by horizontal or vertical is, um, I used to make a joke, you know, I, I don't remember everybody's name because I have a very small hard drive of brain power. It's about three gigs, maybe. That's about all I can remember at any given time. <laughs> so it's like, got to delete this and then move on. Um, but if you think about your your abilities mentally in terms of an actual length. And some people are longer and some people are shorter. But if you took that line and you'd say, take a PhD, someone who's a physicist, they have an extreme depth of knowledge in that space. But the line's only so long. So they've chosen a lack of knowledge in other key areas to have that length and have that ability to do those deep dives. But somebody who's very horizontal is the other way. They know a little bit, just enough to get in trouble in a lot of spaces. But that, that usually allows them to make connections. And if they can start kind of, and obviously people are somewhere in between. It's more of a graph in terms of what it looks like. But if you can identify, is my client vertical or horizontal or where they lie in that space, it'll help you immensely in trying to relate to them. Because most designers, I mean, the part I love about that I mentioned before is all of a sudden you're designing cameras and you get to learn all sorts of stuff about cameras. And you just be wary you don't learn too much about cameras or you won't be very useful designing them. Uh, you can be an engineer, and I'll put you in a cave. Um, so it, it's just something to think about in terms of being vertical or horizontal and where the benefits lie. Um, <clears throat> this is something I, I made a comment uh, a couple years ago. I spoke at Circus, which is kind of a big advertising event. Um, and I basically made an argument that Nike doesn't have a brand. And I'll show you where I was going with this. <laughs> so I was about to be lynched by a 1,000 advertising execs. Like, what? Um, and it, what I meant was that as, as time is going on, our brands uh, are becoming more and more transparent. The ability to actually know more and more about the story and the brands than what they really represent is becoming very, very transparent. And my comment to Nike was that Nike essentially is, to some degree, without, you know, slander, they, they're an amazing company, so let me get that out of the way. But at the same time, a lot of their stories about child labor laws, about exploitation, there's, there's a whole bunch of other things that they don't want to deal with. Um, and what they do is they actually pay athletes to gain story. So I pay Michael Jordan as if Michael Jordan couldn't be Michael Jordan without Nike shoes. So I'll pay him to be part of my brand. I'll brand him. Therefore, his story is part of my story and there's a relationship. And so that's what I was saying. Be careful about diving too much into brand. And it's how you do it. But brand really drives a lot of illusion. So, and that illusion is how much you make it. But the story, if you have a true story and you're being transparent about it, you can really draw a lot of empathy. I think the this, this stove and some of the other things that we've looked at today illustrate that. Uh, emotion versus logic. This is an advertising thing. Logic is great. I deal with a lot of scientists now. Um, they're fantastically logical, and it's great to talk to them and everything else, but it doesn't get anything done. Um, and, you know, they say, well, you're full of shit. You know, I get this done, and then we can do this and this and this. And I said, well, yeah, but emotion gets you done. If you don't believe me, the advertising industry wouldn't exist. Uh, <clears throat> so this, again, is a little controversial, but it's, it's not so much about the consumer. It's, it's more about the job they want done and, and identifying what that job is. I think it's great, and, and obviously you have to relate to what the consumer wants and all these things, but I think if you're really trying to be disruptive and do something out of the normal, you need to really look past the consumer. If you're asking a consumer to tell you what they want, you shouldn't be doing your job because you should be a lot better at being able to identify those things than what they can do. Um, let's quick do this. Um, core intent, this is a big thing. This is a military term that we always deal with. Uh, have you guys ever heard that core intent? I'm sure you have. No, maybe some of you. No one likes me. I wasn't going to say anything. Um, <clears throat> Core intent is just a big picture idea. Is is really at a stripped down thing. Like we're going to go over there and make that country free, or what? You know, I'm not saying it was a good idea, but <clears throat> I apologize right now. Um, but but what what is it that you're fundamentally trying to do? Right. I, I taught a packaging class at Art Center when I was teaching there. Uh, when I was actually attending there, 
And I used to joke, I came in just to kind of mix up the student, I said, welcome to Landfill 101, that if you're disproportionately good at your job, you will contribute more to the landfill than any other human as a designer. This is what you get to do. So it was, but it was just because we had an environmental project. It was just to get them starting to think about, look at the big picture. What are you really trying to do? Um, yeah, you already know this. <laughs> just getting the red beep. So this is talking about drivers of innovation. Um, quickly, just this kind of, none of these things have gone away. They kind of just all fall on themselves, but it goes to the, the collaborative nature of working together to actually come up with new innovative things. Just trying to get through here. So I'll, I'll, finish, I'll finish here, it's pretty much done. Um, these are some core principles that we just kind of throw into the space. Um, so this idea of resilience as opposed to strength, being able to try and fail, try and fail, try and fail, which again we already talked about today. The pull versus push, the focus on you know, being, being aware, remaining too safe. Um, the big one is, you know, that I like is that, you know, use a compass, not a map. If there's a map where you're going, if you're trying to be innovative, somebody's already been there because there's a map. So being able to kind of head in the right direction, this is just something for science guys, right? Is it half full or half empty? Is that probably what you're thinking? So this is a science joke. It's not going to be funny. Um, <clears throat> but the science thing is you rat bastards, you're scientists, it's 100% full, it's just oxygen. Uh, I know, I know. There's a reason I work behind the camera, not in front. So that's me, guys. I know I'm out of time, so thank you very much.